in this episode, I'm going to show you this. Oh, well, there you go. I guess you can go now, unless you want to see it working. You trust me, right? It does work. So last time on Moron Builds a Voron, I think I left you with most of the parts printed after explaining how I was printing them, and that's kind of how the project was then. This was around the end of November, I think. This episode is going to be some of me talking about building the printer, and some of me talking about the printer generally, and some of me talking about the kit, and probably anything in between. I'm essentially finished, as you can see. I wasn't sure how many episodes this would end up being. Also, the channel name is being changed to Last in Tech because the V0.2 is actually out now. This was announced last week. Uh, I watched it so you don't have to. The long and short is the main changes are that the lid is now square. Does this remind you of an old turntable if you're old enough? But anyway, some other stuff, but mainly the lid is square. I can't actually remember the other stuff. Um, I think there's a bottom cover as well so that you can't poke things into the power pins. I mean... That's useful for sure. I've nearly done that a few times while picking it up. Um, as you can see, I've not printed out the lid of the 0.1 yet. It is called the top hat. Um, I mean, maybe by the time I film the footage for this, I might have printed out the top hat. Probably not. I will print out the hat in due course. It's not necessary unless you're printing ABS, ASA, nylon or so on, and you actually need the enclosure to be um, fully enclosed. And I'm not doing that because the only reason I would do that is if I was printing another Voron, and I'm not into chain building Vorons. Um, so I guess first I'll cover the build. This is not a build video because nobody wants to see a build video of a printer that's just been obsoleted last week. I might in fact go as far as to say uh, that with few exceptions you don't need to see a build video. And those few exceptions where you do need to see a build video, or at least part of one, includes getting your head around the design language that the Voron manual seems to use. And by that I mean you need to see a bit of Modbot's build video that I'll link below. But by that, I also mean you need to understand what the manual is telling you, because it's not always explicit. If you go into this build cold, straight from a set of IKEA assembly instructions, for example, you're going to make some mistakes. It is not as... I don't want to say clear, it just uses a different language. It is perfectly clear, as long as you understand what it's trying to say. The main points, I guess, that I could take from my build that I can give you to help not make the same mistakes if you do decide to build a, a Voron 0.1 are as follows. Firstly, when it says preload nuts, you are just slotting these nuts into the frame in the slots of the extrusion. They're M3 nuts irregardless, uh, every single preloaded nut is the same, with very few exceptions, just keep on generally using the same M3 nuts into the frame. Whenever you have to put nuts in the frame, same nuts. And I think that's not necessarily explicitly clear at the beginning. On the topic of those preloaded nuts, you can, if you wish, print out some thingies that you can use to stop the nuts from sliding about. I did not print these out because um, I'm an idiot, but I think it made it harder to get the nuts to sit in position by not using them. Now, the manual does not mention the existence of these things, except it does it now, I think, for the 0.2. At least I've heard that. I am on the fence about these because while they do help the nuts stay where they are when you're building, they're also going to stop you being able to move them as easily. So I think it's a personal opinion on whether these are beneficial or not. By the end of the build, I think I was probably used to the idea of sliding them up and down the rails like a weird puzzle cube. It did frustrate me a lot at the beginning, though. So your mileage may vary. And still on the topic of nuts, you are going to hate this about the manual. It never draws screw threads or nuts at all. Again, something to get used to. It's all very well saying, oh, that doesn't matter. But the thing is, if you're new to the manual, it does matter. But by the end of the manual, it doesn't matter because you understand what it's telling you, if that makes sense. Moving on from nuts, these extrusions, you need to identify them by their hole placements, but there's one gotcha here, and that is that some of them are tapped in the ends and others are not, and that is not that obvious. If you don't identify this, you might accidentally end up using the tapped ones, because the last ones you need for the frame um, are tapped, and... There's a good chance if you didn't realise, you've probably got like one tapped one and one untapped one left. I did that, um, I solved it 
instead of disassembling the whole thing, I just tapped the ends, but you might not have that luxury and swapping them out will probably set you back. I'm going to say at least a couple of hours. It might, it might be more than that. It would be, it would be a bad time. What else? Uh, some things are not super critical that it appears are in the manual. Um, it's not that critical where, for example, the linear rails sit on the aluminium extrusion, not down to the millimetre, certainly not down to the half millimetre. It's not even that critical that they're straight, which is weird given that they give you a guide piece to make sure they're straight. This is not that important. In fact, you will end up probably undoing that when you get to the point of tramming the bed and tramming the rails because you want them to run freely. You don't care how they sit on the rails. You just want them to run freely. Um, they have to be parallel to each other and that's what makes them run freely. It will make sense when you're building. I wouldn't stress too much over when it gives you a measurement that you have to align something to and you have to use a ruler. You don't need to get the vernier calipers out to do that. Um, usually it's something you're going to calibrate later. Finally, I think heat inserts are pretty easy, it turns out. I was expecting heat inserts to be difficult given that, you know, you can get um, you can get things to put them in straight and there's a device that I think uh, Adafruit made to put them in straight. It's really not that big a deal. The way that the holes are designed on the printed parts, they kind of sink themselves in in the right sort of orientation. I used this five pounds USB soldering iron, which is better than you might expect. The pointy tip just kind of pushes them in and they always seem to go in straight. I didn't have any issues throughout the whole build without paying much attention to anything not screwing into one of these inserts. And that was one of my concerns. I do recommend a lower temperature um, because the smoke, if that gets into your eyes, it really hurts. So ventilate and keep it the lowest temperature you can so that it doesn't start smoking. So, what do I think overall of the Voron build process? Um, I think for the Zero, at least for me, I, I found it a bit tedious. I enjoyed some parts, but a lot of it, I don't think it's really worth reading into that too much. I find most build processes of everything, including um, construction toys, I, I find them all tedious. And you will get this too if you decide to build one. For a lot of it, you look at the manual and you see that you have to align six screws to nuts that you just can't see. and. I'll be honest, it's frustrating, and I, I think it would be equally frustrating even if you did print out the, the holders that I talked about earlier. I just can't see that being anything other than frustrating, but you have to align them and poke them into place and then screw into them. I, I know I'll get pushback for saying this because the final design is very clever, but the assembly has some definitely annoying steps. This kind of moaning is not meant to put you off, it's just to give you a realistic expectation of how, how the build went for me. If you have any dexterity issues at all in your fingers, you are going to have a hard time with this build. Anyway, in terms of outright difficulty, um, how hard it is to actually fit the parts together, it's really not that hard. The, the actual assembly is probably trivial, I want to say. There are gotchas, of course, that the first time you build it, you are going to fall for, like this one here, where I put the motor on with the socket pointing the wrong way because it looked like it ought to go that way. But then when it came to wiring, I found that the wiring loom I was given was too short to reach. But if you were wiring this and crimping it yourself, it would be a non-issue, but we're going from a kit here. So yeah, there's quite a few traps like that that you can get into if you don't see them coming. Many of them are pointed out in the manual, but some of them you kind of have to figure out yourself and and other than that you are just following the instructions so I don't doubt that literally anyone dexterity issues notwithstanding anyone can build a Voron Zero as long as you can get the screws and nuts to line up without going crazy one of the key worries I had going into this was that my ABS parts would not fit and again this is not mentioned in the manual but apparently there is a calibration piece that you should print first before you even start printing out the parts I still don't know where that is. I'm sure if I spent time looking, I could find it. But um, broadly speaking, my parts did actually fit with the exception of one piece. And that is the cowling for the hot end. And I'm pretty sure that that's not a calibration issue because my fans were, I think they were oversized slightly. FISETC has a repository with a couple of parts updated in it. And one of them is the cowling. So 
I kind of feel like it was a contentious issue to start with. I used their version, but I still had to increase it by 1%. If you're finding a struggle getting anything to fit, don't be afraid to either print it again or get out a drill in the case of holes and just drill the holes because ABS really does drill very easily. And I'm going to say it again so that I can be called incompetent again. If you saw part one, every single piece of this build was printed on the Sovol SV06 in the garage at stupidly cold temperatures. And with the exception of this tiny hole here where the X stop sensor mounts, not one part split or failed at all. And by the way, most pieces, if you do get a split or a crack, stop, um, super glue it, clamp it, come back to it, it will be fine. Anyway, once assembled, you have to do the electronics, which probably was the most enjoyable part for me. I think you can really see the printer come together at this point when you're wiring up the, um, the looms. Uh, it's worth mentioning that my kit also had pre-crimped connectors, which honestly, I would say don't buy a kit that doesn't have crimped connectors because you're probably saving maybe like four hours work there and that's a significant amount of the build time. At this point when you have the printer assembled and it's potentially working it powers up but what do you need to do? It doesn't move because why would it? You have to set up clipper on the board and also on the Raspberry Pi. The setup of Clipper is quite involved and you probably need to take a bit of a, a bit of a nap or a rest or walk away from it and come back to it because you don't want to go straight from, yeah, I mean, we all, we're all going to, aren't we? we? We go straight into it. Um, if you're lucky, the board will come with Clipper on it like, like the, um, the cheetah here does. You still have to reflash the SD card if, like me, you want to use it with Wi-Fi. I think it probably took about an hour, all told, to get that part working to the point where I was able to level the bed and print absolutely not a Benchy. Surprisingly, considering at least three people called me useless and incompetent after the last episode, including the guy who came into Discord to tell me that when I wasn't there, it was all very confusing. I, I still don't quite know why specifically I'm incompetent. Maybe it's just a general comment. You guys are really charming, by the way. Thank you for that. The Voron Zero, though, actually worked first time without any tuning needed. Sort of. We'll, we'll get to that. But it actually printed a surprisingly neat cube. And... Honestly, there were several stages during the build that I did not think that would be the case. It, it, it's really strange when you're building this printer, it doesn't seem like you're building a printer that's going to work. But there you go, it, it all came together in the end. But that is just the beginning of the config. And if you look at the page here on secondary tuning, there's still stuff you need to do. Belt tension is a funny one because there's this sort of idea maintained that the belt should be somehow insanely tight. But the recommended starting tension is... Um, I have no idea what an LB is. LB? I, I asked Google and it said 0.9 kilograms, so whatever. This value is actually, to me, it's pretty low. If if you look back at the, um, the video I did on belt tension, I realise this is a starting point, but yeah, it certainly looks like the same rules apply to um, bed slingers and core XYs when it comes to maximum bed belt tension. I didn't expect that. I don't know why I didn't expect that, because the reasons I give in that, that other video, but... There you go. Anyway, the point I mentioned a minute ago was the issues I had with some layer shifts and some really odd noises. We're talking like banging noises here. And I thought, oh no, incompetent guy strikes again. Um, we've built this thing wrong and it's it's just banging. But actually, no, this was from having Stealth Chop enabled. I, I'm sure a smart person will correct me in the comments, but my understanding is that Stealth Chop reduces the available torque and the NEMA 14 motors, because they're smaller than NEMA 17s on normal printers, they're sort of spec'd to under an amp uh, maximum current, which honestly isn't that much when you consider the path the belts have to take, and that's going to add quite a bit of static friction. And you don't want to overdrive them, you could probably run them at like one and a half amps or whatever, but uh, it would literally melt the part they're attached to, as that's ABS, and ABS will start to warp at fairly low temperatures, like maybe 70 degrees C or so, even though the motors will be happy to go up to 120 C, and when I tested them with the thermometer, they, they weren't getting above about 50 degrees C, but the, the, the deal is you're, um, you're kind of underclocking them to stop it melting the printer, but... But long story short, if you actually turn off Stealth Chop, the printer will be slightly less quiet, technically, because it's not running in silent stepper mode. But actually, honestly, no, because it was banging before and grinding. So, yeah, I think the noise is actually less with that off. But 
this is going to be dependent on the steppers and the drivers, so your mileage may vary here too. So you probably want to see how fast I dared to run the printer at. It seems like all anyone cares about with these things is benches and running fast, and I'm not doing benches, so... Yeah, this is about as fast as I'm willing to go, and... Honestly, it's not, it's not bad, is it? It's not as fast as the V400, but it's unlikely to be anyway, 400 millimeters per second with ridiculous delta accelerations. Yeah, this is probably my second fastest printer at this point. So, so yeah, that's a reasonable result, I think. I'm, I'm not disappointed by that. In fact, I'm quite surprised it can go that fast, but there you go. I guess I had fairly low expectations of my building abilities, but let's summarize then. Uh, firstly, was the kit any good? Yeah, it was fine. You can tell that it's a cheaper kit than the LDO one that everyone favours. Not that I've seen or used that kit, but I keep getting told about how much it's better. And anyway, um, at the same time, the printer is working fine. And I, broadly speaking, I have no issues. So if you sum up what it would cost you, the kit is around $300. If you add $60 for filament, ignore time because that's free, right? And as I already said, I think anyone who has the patience, willpower and dexterity can build one of these. It's not hard. It just needs commitment, and you will be happy with the result, I'm sure of it. And on that note, I think I'm ready to move on. Next up, I think, is a review of the nesting set of three Neptunes. We've got a printer so big it can hold a zero on its build plate, and then there's one even bigger than that. So yeah, subscribe, and I will catch you next time.